Okay, so first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me here and give me the opportunity to give a talk. I'm very excited to be here, but I'm also very nervous because it's the first conference after two, two years and few months, and it's the first talk I gave in the past two years. So today I'm going to talk about bosons and fermions in some particular regime from few to many. I would like to acknowledge my collaborators for this work. Joe, that is here, Bira, that is here, and, si and Silvio Vitello. All right, so just an introduction. This is a scheme of the unitary gas as a function of the inverse of the scattering length. This is well known as being a very popular topic in the, in the last decade or so. So by tuning the interaction, we, we have a crossover from a system that is in the BCS. So fermions are paired on the Fermi surface, weakly interacting, then they go to the, strong, the very strong interacting regime known as the unitary limit when the scattering land diverges. And then by keep increasing the interaction strengths, eventually the, the fermions form molecules that behave like a weakly interacting Bose gas. So it's possible to realize these systems in a very dilute regime. So the interaction is mainly as wave. The fraction is very, is very low. And also in the experiments, they can cool down these systems uh, almost to the zero temperature. Experimentally, the interaction can be tuned. So they can, all these regimes can be spun. And there's a crossover, as I said, from weakly interacting fermions paired in the BCS state to weakly repulsive bosons between molecules. So as an example of fermionic superfluids, we have superconductors, liquid helium-3 ITC superconductors that they have a pairing gap going from 10 to minus four to 10 to minus two in units of the Fermi energy. And cold Fermi gases are very, very strongly paired. So they have a pairing up of the order of 0.5, so much higher than the others. And recently, it has been proved by calculations, but also from neutron star observations, that also neutrons can be paired, strongly paired in some regime with a pairing gap that is very similar to cold Fermi gases. These systems are very interesting to study. Just as I said, the interaction can be tuned in experiments through flashback resonances. There's a new universality connecting free fermions to free bosons. There are beautiful experiments. So people measure the equation of state. They measure the contact parameter in various ways. Various response functions like density response and spin response have been measured and many other properties. But what I like about these systems is that they have very similar properties to low density neutron matter. And that's why I, as a nuclear physicist, became very interested to in these systems. So in this talk, I will basically focus to two topics. The first one is what about unitary bosons? Are they universal? So unitary Fermi gases received a lot of attention, but unitary bosons didn't receive the same attention. In the second part of the talk, I'm gonna discuss fermions in a trap, and I'll try, to under, I'll try to show that they can be maybe useful to learn about nuclear physics. So let me start from the unitary Bose gas. So we, the model is the following. We consider a two-body attractive interaction set to the unitary limit, so infinite scattering length and a small effective range. We, as we heard in previous talks, these lead to an instability between bosons. So we need a three-body repulsion to avoid the system collapsing. We, we basically, once we, we decide also the effective range of the three-body force, our strategy is to tune the interaction of this three-body repulsion in such a way to have a weakly bound trimer with a, with, a, a, with a radius that is much larger than the range of these two interactions. And then we want to understand what happens when we realize these things, and then we, we change basically the, the effective ranges of the two forces. 
So in this problem, the energy scale is given by the primer binding energy. And I will try to convince you that with these conditions, the system is universal. Uh, in particular, it does not depend on the detail of the interaction. So one slide on the method, my favorite method is based on, is based on Juan Monte Carlo. So it's possible to show that by, take, by starting from a wave function, whatever it is, by applying the propagator in imaginary time t with the Hamiltonian age, after a long time, uh, time long enough, we can extract the properties of the ground state of the system. The, the only condition is that the ground state is not orthogonal from what we start with, okay? This can be done by, with an integral. So we have a trial wave function as a function of all the coordinates of the system. We need a many body propagator telling us how to sample configurations from the previous one based on the Hamiltonian. And, and in such a way, we can evolve our wave function in imaginary time. In this case, the many body propagator is pretty much in any case unknown. So we need some approximation and there are several approximations working pretty well in the small time limit. So for example, now G is a propagator for a very small time. And then we can basically separate the kinetic part from the potential part. And we can use Monte Carlo techniques to solve these many body integrals. So since we need to reach the a long imaginary time limit, we need to perform this integral, integral many, many times until our observables converge. These methods, these numerical methods require computing time, but they are very powerful because they are very useful to calculate properties of many body systems in a very accurate way. In particular, they are exact for bosons and there are good approximate, they provide a pretty good approximations for fermions. So to simulate unitary bosons, just to give you a taste, we use a variational wave function that contains a one body confinement for the particles. So these are the coordinates of all the particles. There are two and three body correlations. And we found that the, the four and the variational optimization of these, of these correlations are crucial for these problems, because otherwise for bosons, we can have an exact result, but the variance, the statistical error of the calculation strongly depends on the quality of the wave function. So here there are different variational parameters that we optimize by lowering the, the variational energy. Okay, in the case of homogeneous matter, we don't need a confinement, so this part is just one. So here are the first results. This is the binding energy of cluster bosons as a function of the number of bosons relative to the primary energy. So let me spend a little bit time here. So the, th the three different colors correspond to different ratio between the three and the two body effective range. And then the closed symbols correspond to a case where the primer is very shallow. So we fix the three body repulsion by requiring that the primer has some energy, some unit, but we carefully check that the RMS radius or the size of this primer is much larger compared to the effective range. When this is the case, we see that the solid points basically overlap within error bars, meaning that the system is not dependent to the model. The results are not dependent to the model. Instead, in the case of open symbols, here the trimers are more bound, still pretty large compared to effective range, but we start to see that they, they, are, they provide different results when we change the ratio of the effective ranges. So in that case, the system becomes model dependent. So here the first result is that the universality or the model independence of these bosonic clusters are provided only when the, the trimers are very weakly bound. Here we can see that for small number of bosons, things are pretty much similar, and then eventually they saturate at some point. So in this case, I'm showing the radii 
in some units defined here. So even for radii, the units are given by the energy of the primer and the same uh, symbols as before. So we see that for closed symbols, the results are very, very similar. So again, model independence. And when we have the trimer that is more bound, so we are starting to be non-universal. The radii again depends on the particular model of the of the three-body force, meaning to the effective range of the three-body force. In this bottom curve, I'm showing the density for one case for different number of bosons, so 10, 20, 40, and 60, if you cannot, if it's not clear enough. So we see that for for 10 class, for 10 bosons, the, the density is not flat at the center, but then eventually it saturates a lot, uh, around some number. So here is another proof as before that the, the system is becoming uh, stable and saturated, okay? Then we went to the infinite system. So this is a simulation now of bosons in a periodic box. Uh, and here is the energy per particle, again, referred to the primary energy as a function of the density with proper units. And then we see again, the closed symbols basically give a, a consistent equation state within statistical uncertainties. The saturation point is very similar to, to where the, the, the density of the cluster saturates. It presents a minimum that is, uh, is for system that eventually saturates and everything is very consistent. The open symbols correspond to trimers that are more bound. So here, the non-universality is very evident, even more than by looking the energy of the clusters. So now let, let me focus to the second part of the talk. So I'm gonna talk about Fermi systems in an external trap, in particular, two component Fermi cases, so spin up and spin down. So we consider fermions interacting in, in S wave in an harmonic trap. So we have kinetic energy, we have the confinement, and then we have a two body interaction that is attractive of this particular form. The form is not really important. And uh, the interaction is only between particles with opposite spin because we want to, in this case, to investigate S-wave interaction. The variational wave function has this form. Again, there are two body correlations, but in this case, it's critical to have DCS correlations because we, we know that the system at the infinite scattering length or very large uh, scattering length is strongly paired. So it's very important to have a BCS form. So we have uh, two body orbitals depending on the position of particles with opposite spin. And in particular, in the case of the trap, this pairing wave function has this form. There's a sum over variational parameters. And then we have two harmonic oscillator states coupled in this case to have zero angular momentum. So when we put these things in a later determinant, the system will have a total angular momentum that is zero. We have variational parameters. And again, we choose these parameters to, to lower as much as possible the variational energy and before propagating in imaginary time. So first, let me talk about, uh, about a a slightly different problem that will introduce me to the next slide. So here is the energy with respect to the Fermi gas of the homogeneous system, but where we put a periodic potential with this four. So we have, we have some strengths and we have some momentum Q. And, we, and this is the energy with respect to the Fermi gas energy as a function of the, the strength and the momentum. So the unitary limit for, uh, for the Fermi, for the unitary ga Fermi gas is around 0.39 with these calculations. So this is the case of V0 equals zero. 
And when we, we, tune, we increase this constant, we, we get some, the system with a lower energy. And basically these, these two set of results correspond to Q taking like the Fermi momentum and Kf over two. Here, the, the different symbols correspond to two different techniques. I don't want to spend too much time, but these are quantum Monte Carlo calculations of different flavor. And here we try to fit the results using a very simple density functional that contains basically the, the, the density dependence and then the gradient and the Laplacian of the, and the second derivative of the density. So we choose this very simple density functional form and we fit these two parameters on these results for different values of Q. Why do we want to do this? Because then we try to use this, this density functional in an external trap, as I will show in the next slide by taking the local density approximation. So here now is the energy of fermions in a trap with respect to Thomas Fermi energy as a function of the number of, uh, of particles. The two bands correspond to just taking the first term in the simple density functional and also taking the second term. So these results are quantum Monte Carlo. These are exact, these are approximate. But we see that by using that very simple density functional, we can very nicely reproduce the direct calculations of fermions in a trap up to a, up to a very small number. So in this case, I think it's eight fermions. Something very important to notice is that the functional is purely bosonic. It doesn't know anything about fermions, okay? In this case, this distance is tuned at unitarity. So this is expected because the, the, system, the, the particles are unbound, but they are so strongly paired that a bosonic density functional can be very useful to, des to describe these systems in a trap. So now, can we use these systems to understand nuclear physics? This is the last part of my talk. So first, let me introduce for the people that are not very familiar, the magic number of, of nuclei. It's pretty evident that nuclei have favorite numbers for neutrons and protons to be very stable. This some signature of magic nuclei. So when these, these numbers are in the, in the nucleus, is that these nuclei are very stable. They have a large separation energy. So if you, the energy that you need to extract, uh, to extract a nucleon is very high compared to other nuclei, the neutron capture cross-section is very low because the, these nuclei like to stay in, in their own configurations. They don't want any extra neutron. There is an example, of course, in atomic physics where magic numbers, they don't correspond to these because nuclear forces are different, but that's uh, another example. Is this the end of the story? Of course not. Magic numbers explain a lot of stable configurations, as I said, but there is experimental evidence that in some particular nuclei, these magic numbers disappear. This is one case for in this case, beryllium 12, where the configuration of it's, it's close for, for neutrons, but then there is a, with the, by filling these orbitals, but there's experimental evidence where two neutrons want to stay in a different shell. So this is an example of breaking of magic numbers. There are many other examples where magic numbers disappear in particular in the case of mid-sized nuclei and for large number of neutrons. So in the past years, for example, people measure very accurately the energy of calcium isotopes. So calcium is 20 protons and 20 neutrons. They measure isotopes up to calcium 60, so with 40 neutrons. And where people expected to have magic numbers, they found no magic numbers. So no stable configurations, no closed shell and nothing. 
Now, let me present. So that's why I decided to, we decided to investigate on this, what could be the origin of this disappearance of magic numbers. So here are the results now, again, back to the up and down Fermi gases in a harmonic trap. So this is the energy as a function of the Thomas Fermi energy. Uh, yeah, for different number of fermions. And here we fix the effective range of the interaction to be pretty small, and we change instead the scattering length. So this bottom case correspond to the unitary limit. So infinite scattering length. And we see that there are absolutely no shell effects. So the opposite is the free gas, that is this upper line. And then here we see that the shell effects are very, very evident and corresponding to the numbers that we expect from the harmonic oscillator, free harmonic oscillator, of course. And then by tuning the, effect, the scattering length to negative values, so we are making the system weak, uh, interacting uh, weakly and weakly, we see that in these, uh, in these units, we start to barely see shell effects, in particular for small par particle numbers like 8, 20 is less evident, and then it becomes flat. But when we keep decreasing the interaction strengths, we fully restore the magic numbers, the shell closure. Okay. So in the case of the, in the BCS size, so weakly interacting limit, we totally restore the shell effects. Now we did another test. So we set the scattering length to infinity now, but then we changed the effective range. So these blue points are exactly the, the previous results for small effective range. And when we increase the effective range or we increase the frequency of the trap, we see in this case is not evident, but then in this, in this green case, we start to have shell effects. And then when we keep increasing, we have drastic bonding of the system and it becomes very model dependent. So let me spend a minute here. So this black is obtained by uh, infinite scattering length and large effective range. This orange correspond to a nuclear case. So it's a toy model to body potential. So it's not nuclear at all, but we tune the scattering length and the effective range to be the ones that the neutron neutron interaction has in nature. And these are the orange points. And these are compared to a pure nuclear interaction. I don't want to spend too much details on this, but here we see that, uh, that the system behaves totally different from the orange things. Because here the effective range is so large that of course we have strong model dependency. So just as a, uh, just to, to say something, it, in the case of the toy model, we have a pure attractive interaction. In the, case of the, in the case of the nuclear potential, we have a strong repulsion and then attraction. We have interaction beyond S waves, so in P waves and higher partial waves. But nevertheless, I think it's very interesting to see that in this case, large effective ranges or large densities, if you fix the effective range and then you increase the, the, the frequency of the harmonic oscillator means increasing the density. In this case, we have a restoration of the shell effects. So this is even more evident by looking at the two particle energy separation. So just by taking the energy of the system with some number of, uh, of atoms minus the energy when we remove two atoms, this is the free case. We see a jump when we fill one shell and we go to the next shell, harmonic oscillator. And here is the case for small effective range, a slightly larger effective range, um, a larger effective range. So here we see the flatness that we have in the free case. 
Alto is not totally restored. And then we have this, the, the case where the system was very binding. And then in this case is not evident at all, because again, we start to see the model dependency of these things. So now consider that neutron-neutron interaction have a large scattering length. So in nuclear units, it's around 19 fermions and a large, but much smaller than the scattering length effective range of the order of three fermions. Can these effects explain why nuclei with many neutrons do not show shell effects? For example, as I said, calcium isotopes. I think the answer is yes, because think about neutrons in the core, they, they feel a large density. And remember, large density, we have shell effects. But then the neutrons on the surface, so when you have such these very neutron rich isotopes, the extra neutrons stays probably on the surface of the nucleus and they feel a low density. And that's maybe why very neutron rich nuclei, they don't show these shell effects or these magic numbers. Of course, there's a question mark here about the model dependence because what I presented was very qualitative and we need to investigate more about this, in particular in the case of large effective range, and we are still working on these things. So let me conclude. I presented the, the unitary both systems that they become uh, universal when the three body interaction is tuned in such a way we have a weekly uh, bash, uh, shallow trimer. Bosonic cluster saturates in this case as liquid helium-4. There's consistency between the uh, extrapolation to large, uh, to big clusters to homogeneous matter. Then I try to convince you that a relatively simple bosonic density functional can be very useful to study small fermionic systems, at least at unitarity. Fermi gases in a trap may provide an explanation of nuclear shell effects, at least qualitatively, qualitatively for now. And my question for people doing experiments is that, can we use ultra cold Fermi gases experiments to understand nuclear physics? In particular, trying to investigate these magic numbers in atomic traps with small uh, particle numbers. And thank you very much for your attention. Questions now from the audience, Alejandro. If there is not the other one, I can start. Uh, yes, very nice. Your, in your first part, you use this um, two-body Gaussian, but with a three-body Gaussian to mm -hmm. describe universal, a unitary Bose gas and show that it's universal. You set the parameters on the force to have a shallow trimer and mm -hmm. then uh, use the, this model and you show your results. It is interesting that the same force or the same potential model can be used to describe also, uh, for example, helium-4, mm -hmm. other systems which are not uh, universal, don't fit inside these conditions to be so shallow. But it's interesting that the same force. So also the, the three-body force, the range of the three-body force that you've tuned to, to have the shallow dimer can be used to uh, can be used to tune the correct saturation of the alien liquid. So it, mm -hmm. it's, it's interesting this uh, this fact that with the same potential model you can use universal, but you can use one of the parameters to go outside the universal regime. Yeah. This is this is interesting. Okay. This is my comment. Oh, it was not a question. Okay, thank no, you. No, uh, you can try. <laughs> That's right. We, we tried uh, using Diffusion Monte Carlo mm -hmm. with Arturo uh, and made the same work, but for, uh, yeah. Mario shows a uh, yes. figure. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, and we can go to pretty large number of particles. I mean, here it's 60, but it's not a limit at all. Well, but there you, you start you make a liquid drop model formula to... Of course. 
Okay. Okay. Tobias? I think it's related to your comment, but anyway, I want to reinstate. I'm really puzzled that the, I mean, the boson system, the bosonic system is so universal. While the Fermi system with the Pauli propulsion and so on, that in principle do not allow to see the short distance of the nuclear interaction so much as in the case of the bond is not universal. So I'm really puzzled with that. I don't know if it is some particular form of the interactions so that you're in talking here. about the nuclear case? Yeah, the, the fermion case you did in the trap. It's, uh, yeah, I'm puzzled really it's by because, this. Uh, I, think, uh, I think this can be understood pretty easily because if you, okay, if you think about, you know, some size of the trap and then the effective range is very small, these pairs act like bosons in the trap, so they don't feel any shell effect. But suppose that your effective range becomes comparable to the size of the trap, then basically this is the extreme, li the extreme limit where, where the effective range is actually larger than the trap. It's like you put all the particles in a mean field. But then now if you take this mean field as flat or with some dependency, then you can understand why you have this model dependence. I mean, we, we saw the same for fermions. For fermions, when the system is dilute or small effective range, there's some paper where we discussed that using very different interaction, even with an R core, give pretty much the same results. But when the effective range becomes large, then you have model dependence because the shape parameters, so the, the, the next terms in the momentum dependence of the interaction, they become important. And that's where the form of the interaction becomes actually important. It is a competition between the average distance in the thermal case with the Yeah, range. of course. Okay, okay. please. Yeah, um, I'm a bit confused because the the, for the unitary bosons, the, so you set the two body interaction to, to the unitary regime, and then mm -hmm. you have a three body interaction. So do you not have the FMOB effect in this case? Uh, that's a good question. I think we can, but we cannot see them with these techniques. But do you, uh, you know, you have a, a trimer, I guess. Right. Yeah, but I don't, I don't know if it's a FMO state or not. Probably it is, but I probably it is because the because the range of the interactions are much smaller than the size of these objects. So probably they are FMO states. They are. Yeah. Okay. So how how is it universal then? If it uh, it's because basically okay, we tune the two body to have infinite scattering length and some effective range, okay? Yeah. Then we tune the three body to have a similar parameter of the effective range, but then we, we consider different cases. And then we tune the strength of the repulsion in such a way to have a, a shallow band trimer. So we can, if we don't have any three body, we have a collapse. Then you start to put repulsion, and but you can in, have. In a, principle, you have an infinite number of, of course. shallow bound. Yes. Yeah, I just am confused. But the, con it. but the condition is if you calculate the, the size of the trimer, yeah. when the size is much bigger than these parameters of the effective range, then we have universality. Otherwise, we don't. Okay. If to clarify, this is the lowest state the excited the, the infinite oh yeah the power of infinite those state. are ground states yes okay yes here not a request i guess i also want to uh, to understand this uh, universality mm -hmm. so you say at unitarity for both i guess mm -hmm. uh, all i need to know is the trimer energy Yes. And I know everything. I don't need to know yes. anything more. It's just that parameter. Yes. If the trimer state is much larger than the range of the potential. Yes. But then you said that the deep, the open symbols were for 
these, in this case, they are not universal because the size of the trimer is becoming comparable to the effective range. So these are okay. deeper bound trimers, if you want. So when the size of the trimer is becoming comparable to the effective range of the interaction. Okay. And then we lose universality. So you say you case. just need to build in three body correlations and two body correlations, that's it. At unitarity, that then you uh, also the many body system, you know everything. Well, again, it's because the system is becoming model dependent, like in the case of S wave unitary Fermi gas. If the interaction is very small, then everything is model independent. But when the effective range becomes larger, yeah. then it depends on the form of the interaction. So, this what, case is not the form, it's just the it depends more on the effective range. Okay, but the, then a quest maybe you don't know, or, but do you expect the same thing to happen when you then go towards the BEC regime? So now you have a two body bound state, or would you need more parameters? Than, uh, yeah, I, I, you're talking about the unitary Fermi gas. Yeah, now. then you go beyond unitary, so you go into when, so A becomes positive. Okay, in the, the DBC, state. I think things are again kind of universal. <sighs> Not sure for large effective ranges, but in that case, it is from the many body energy, you subtract the two body energy, binding energy corresponding to that model. Maybe things are still similar. You know what I mean? Yeah. But, but because you would expect that when you start, get bounce states, you start probing the short range. Yeah, of course. So it's not so clear. Huh? Yeah. I, well, okay. Suppose, okay, if you take the limit of zero effective range, Okay, you have up and down forming a molecule and that's it. But if you have a larger effective range, larger than the size of the molecule, you know, yeah, one fermion is... can interact with a, the, another fermion of the other molecule. So then I think you lose in universality also in that case. Okay, Miguel. Yeah, so your analogy with magic numbers so by by modifying the effective range you make all magic numbers disappear but you don't make new ones appear that's true yes absolutely because in neutron rich yeah nuclei the the magic numbers don't disappear they change so yes that's right this, as i said this is a preliminary qualitatively start qualitative study where i we were interested to understand why shell effects disappear or I'm making a very stretched analogy with nuclei. But can, can you think of a way yeah. in, in, in which you could, within this frame, make okay. the, 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 the so magic numbers change? Okay, so if I, oh, changing, I don't know. I mean, but shift. Disappearing, yes. Yeah. Because qualitatively, okay, if you think about the nuclear mean field is something like this. Let me stress this a little bit. It's like the wood saxon, right? I can approximate this, this part with an harmonic oscillator like this. And this part on the surface, so you have, you know, these levels in the mean field and you approximate this with an harmonic oscillator like this. As I showed in this case, I have shell effects. In this case, I don't. So when you have a nucle a stable nucleus up to here, you have magic numbers. When you keep throwing neutrons, you start to populate these states, and then they feel a different frequency if you want. Probably, uh, I don't know, but the three body force could play a role of in course. changing the magic number. Could be here. I just wanted to see why they disappear, not why they change. Or I have a so uh, in the nuclear many body system, you can write uh, the intrinsic interaction as a mean field plus residual interactions, right? Mm -hmm. So you are using a model in which you already have a mean field. No, well, right. I don't have a mean field. But you have effectively, you're working in a trap, right? A harmonic oscillator yes. trap, yeah. which mimics kind of the mean field effect, right? So, 
So uh, I am doubting to what extent the residual interactions can be described by a large scattering length and a small effective range. I know that can be done for uh, nuclear interactions in vacuum, right? The intrinsic interactions, but once you already put the mean field in, uh, I would guess that the residual interactions will look different. Could be, I don't, I don't know, honestly. Other questions? One thing that interests me about this graph is that you did not include any negative effective ranges. Is there uh, anything you've looked at there? I mean, this is not so uncommon, at least in atomic physics. Calculations with quantum Monte Carlo and negative effective ranges are very challenging. We tried to do that in a homogeneous case a few years ago. The problem is that for, uh, in the case of negative effective ranges, usually you have some potential with an attraction, then a slight repulsion, and then going to zero. That case is very, very delicate to be simulated with these techniques. Can be done, we did in the past, never published the results for the homogeneous again up and down fermi gas can be done but uh, it's, uh, it's numerically very challenging problem I, I was also wondering uh in terms of the shell structure of nuclei and so on um i believe there might, there are presumably some nuclei that have a large uh scattering volume for uh, P wave interaction mm -hmm. with the neutron, right? Do you do you know examples like that? Then that would look like halo halo nuclei with two neutrons dominantly P wave interacting with the core. Mm -hmm. No, I don't. I don't. Know you don't know of any example examples of that. like that. No, I'm sorry. So maybe a question towards your question, whether one can learn something from cold atoms experiments. Mm -hmm. how, how easy or how difficult is it to change the trapping potential to be, for example, an isotropic or even two-dimensional? Oh, it's, it's trivial. It's yeah. possible. So this case is a three-year, you know, isotropic trap. It's easy to put different frequencies along X, Y, and Z. I mean, it's a little bit more of work because of the form of the of the wave function because in this case it's just a isotropic harmonic oscillator but in the past i tried to take orbitals uh, different orbitals along x y and z with different parameters so it's totally possible or even changing the geometry from harmonic oscillator to something with r to the fourth or whatever could be useful for experiments Thank you. Um, can you go to page 18? Oh, 13. Yeah. This one? 18. Oh, 18. Mm -hmm. Sorry. So in nuclear shear model, uh, to reproduce these magical numbers, uh, mm -hmm. we also have the spin orbital interaction. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But do you have that term? Uh, well, not in this case. I mean, there's a spin orbit here because this is a nuclear case. I mean, with nuclear, with a realistic nuclear interaction and there's a spin orbit there. And in fact, the magic numbers, I think the you see there's a 40 here and they appear later. Yeah, but there's a spin orbit interaction there. So for this, it's uh, eight and twenty. You you don't know how that. I, yeah, I don't have the right figure, but I can show you later. It's not very evident because the spin orbit in this case is not very strong, so it's not enough to give you an extra shell. For this is just neutrons; it's not nuclei. But you see, as some paper where you see the next number, it's at fifty. And in that case, for nuclear, for neutrons, it's evident. 
but I don't think in the other cases. And also, how how do we include the effect range uh, effect? Do you include the last oh, in order? Oh, you can. I mean, you can either fix that, fix your two body to have an effective range and change the frequency of, of the harmonic trap, or you can change the effective range. I mean, fix the harmonic trap and change the effective range to this parameter here in the two body interaction in this toy model. Mm -hmm. You can do it in both ways. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Stefano, going back to the boson case that I'm yeah. still puzzled. I mean, uh, the, the saturation comes from the repository body force, no doubt. Yes, of course. And I am wondering if you tuned your Gaussian interaction or your two body mm -hmm. interaction with repulsive inner core and two feet, uh, just let me finish the question. Very good question. <laughs> uh, to fit your triton. Yes. And, uh, and then you don't in principle need the three body force. And I think this case you are not going to saturate. This is very interesting okay. question because I discussed that with Bira two days ago. Because my my observation was, do I always need a three body force? And he said yes. Otherwise, the system always collapses. And I asked why liquid hel helium four doesn't collapse. And the answer is because it's an infinite core. Mm -hmm. But if you have a finite repulsion, the system would eventually collapse. No, well, no, it depends on the Pro ratio. Probably, but... yeah, but eventually it would for some number of particles. Because if it's... A... Yeah, sorry for interrupting, but it depends on the ratio between the well depths and the height, right? I mean, but you have a lower the... bound uh, due to the depths of your potential. You can't be lower than the bottom of your potential. So if if your uh, height is um, sufficiently high, you're not going to collapse. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't have to go to infinity. But I think for some large number of particles, eventually the system would collapse unless you have a really an infinite barrier at the origin. To what I understand. If you mean that right. the energy goes to minus infinity, then quantum mechanics is not allowing that because you have a lower bound in quantum mechanics that's set by the bottom of the potential unless you use the delta function interaction, in which case I would agree with you. Yeah. I maybe Bira wants no, to. For the record, my one, my, my, our discussion was about the delta function interaction. Okay. Then I agree. So should we stop or can we have another question? So mine. <laughs> uh, are you are you able to because you can reach for the. 50 fermions, are you able to determine what is the number, the minimum number of helium-3 that gets bound? Of, of what, sorry? Helium-3 atoms. You know that above 34, they are bound. Could you determine? I mean. Well, yes, but for sure it are different. <laughs> so now you're talking about helium-3 droplets. And yeah, I mean, in principle, yes. I mean, you keep throwing particles until the system gets some binding energy. In principle, yes. I mean, not if that number is a million. No, it's, but set, if it's 34 for sure. 34, it could be yeah. 30, but yes. I think you can you can get that. This is it's very important. It's yeah, it's, it's possible. An uh, incredible system. You remove one and it explodes. So there is no any subsystem. So it could be, you can use it because if it is bound, the binding energy should not depend on the omega of the harmonic oscillator trap. This is the way. Well, we... the, the way I would do that calculation is just considering particles not in a trap and then calculate the energy. And you said the threshold is 34 up. Yes. 
calculate for 36. The system is bound. Calculate with 34. I don't know. Calculate with 32. Okay. See that the system is unbound. Okay. Or something like that. Yes, possible. This is a, is a very fascinating system. It's a super Borromean system. You remove one and 34 go. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes, it explodes. It doesn't. It becomes. I think. Well, my my impression is that it will becomes a resonance with positive energy, but long lived. But it doesn't right away disappear uh, as an object. Well, it's not a bound state, but it's a resonance. Maybe, maybe it will be resonant. Depends on the number of cells. We are now in the free discussion session. <laughs> Make a smooth transition. I think the first thing we should do is thank the speaker again. <laughs>